Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook Live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Tonight, our featured guests are Martin Rokic, an award-winning composer and co-creator of the new oratorio, Bodies on the Line, The Great Flint Sit-Down Strike, and Dr. Mieko Hatano, Executive Director of the Oakland Symphony. Also joining us tonight is Dr. Lino Rivera, Professor of Music at St. Mary's College of California. Martin, welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us. Martin, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I am foremost a composer. I'm also a classical guitarist, a retired music professor. I taught for over 30 years at St. Mary's College of California, and I, I love teaching. Most of the music I've written ha has been instrumental. I, I love instrumental music. I find it very meaningful, though the meaning is hard to articulate in words. I've written lots of duos, trios, quartets, and orchestra music, and I've always loved opera. I've never written one. And I've strongly, always strongly felt that if I'd given the opportunity, I could compose a dramatic vocal work. And the piece we'll be discussing today is not an opera, um, but it is in the same ballpark. It's an oratorio uh, where we have singers in front of an orchestra and chorus. Um, they're not walking around the stage. There's not sets, there's not scenery, there's not props, but but it's it's but it is a dramatic vocal work. Um, I didn't write it alone. I wrote all the notes, and I worked with a very talented uh, librettist and dramaturg named Rebecca Engel. Um, and I could go on about myself, but I will not. We well, we will in a second. Sure. Welcome, Mieko. Hi, Simeon. Thank you so much for having us, Mieko. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Of course, of course. I'm executive director at Oakland Symphony. I've been at that post since 2018. Um, it's my third executive director role. And um, I have also actually come from the musician, a musician background. I have a doctorate in French horn performance, believe it or not. Uh, but I have been in management for over 15 years. So um, I come at it with a, a dual love um, and a, a passion for stewarding classical music and orchestral music in particular. So this is truly part of my passion as well. And Mieko, can you tell us how did you meet Martin? When, uh, how, how did that happen? Was it for this oratorio? It was for this oratorio actually. Um, our now late music director, uh, Maestro Michael Morgan, um, who actually passed away this last August, uh, very suddenly. Um, he was a master of creating relationships and actually, he met uh, Marty through um, our, our, one of our flutists in our orchestra who had commissioned him to do a piccolo uh, concerto. Um, and so that's how Michael got to know him. And then, of course, Michael, when he said, we are doing this oratorio, I'm so excited about it. This is right up our alley. Um, you know, it's, it, this is part of our, our important commissioning work. Um, I jumped on board and uh, got to get closer and closer to, to Martin, as well as Rebecca, the librettist. So it's really been a pleasure to work with them. Okay, so Martin, let's go to your uh, compositions. We are about to hear Sleepless Night performed by the Sid Muse Ensemble. Can you tell us a little bit about this composition and why, when I asked you for an example, you decided that this would be a representative of your work? Sure. Well, first of all, you asked me for a very brief example, which cuts out a lot of things, Simeon, because it's hard to find just 30 seconds. And I, and I appreciate that you did that. Um, it was written for this group in New York, the Cygnus Ensemble. The instrumentation is uh, flute, violin, cello, and guitar. Um, um, the piece is called Sleepless Night, and it 
reminds me of a sleepless night and uh, we're gonna hear just a chunk of like a 30 or 40 second chunk of it that conveys a mood of restless agitation played beautifully by the Cygnus Ensemble. Okay, let's uh, have a listen now. Fantastic. So, uh, Mar uh, Martin, tell us, uh, tell us about this composition, and more generally, tell us how you became a composer. Clearly, you've dedicated your life, uh, two hundred percent, to this art. Tell us what uh, what what makes you tick. How come you got into this, and what's your mission? Hmm. Okay. Um, as I look back on my life, I wrote some songs in fourth grade, and then again in high school. And um, I I'll let me, let me just say there is no rational reason to ever become a composer. <laughs> but it is a craving, an irrational craving maybe. And like almost every artist, I would become ill or at least extremely cranky if I didn't do it. You asked about the mission of my music. Mm, that is not complicated. I hope that it might resonate inside a listener, that somebody might find it stimulating or gratifying, memorable, hopefully memorable. However, let me just add a dramatic and political work, the first of, that I've ever written, like, like this oratorio, Bodies on the Line. This has an added mission to me that an instrumental piece of music like Sleepless Night does not have. And it is to amplify sympathy for all the folks who work, 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 and have very little to show for it except bills. Okay, and we will hear about that uh, in one of your uh, examples from the oratorio. Uh, right away. But first, I would like to now turn to the Oakland Symphony to take a look at an example of their work. Fantastic. So Mieko, tell us a little bit about this Oakland Symphony and what exactly what it what the association does, what the parts of it are, and what it does now since you're executive director. What's its mission? Sure. Well, um, that orchestra that you just saw is a, a regional professional orchestra, the Oakland Symphony. We have been around for, my goodness, almost 90 years performing uh, symphonic music here in the East Bay. Um, Michael Morgan, who you saw conducting um, until this last August, was our music director for 30 years. So that was quite the legacy. We also have a chorus, a youth orchestra, and we're in um, dozens of schools in Oakland Unified School District. And our mission is to strengthen our community by providing quality live performances, education for lifetime enrichment, and the perpetuation of the performing arts. Uh, accessibility, of course, and inclusivity so that uh, classical music can be something that can be in every person's life. Um, we believe that is a fundamental right and, um, and need for our, the health of our community. So we continue that mission. Uh, it's very, very well ingrained into us. And uh, we're just continuing that on and expanding and and trying to uh, trying to bring more classical music um, to more people in our community. So Mieko, I see here, like you said, you have a, a chorus, you've got a, a professional orchestra, and then you have a youth orchestra. So is one more important than the other, or are they equally important? And what's um, what? Uh, how do you? Um, yeah, how is that natural? Is that what is 
the consensus that an orchestra association today should be those three things? I don't know if it should be those three things, but in Oakland, it's the right thing. Um, we tend to do a lot of choral music, vocal music. We like to tell stories through our, our concerts. Uh, this oratorio that Marty's going to be talking about um, very soon is a, a perfect example of that. And you need a chorus to do those things. It also helps get our community involved in the music making process professionals go to school and start their instruments, you know, when they're three, four, five years old, and not everybody has that opportunity to do it. And so choral music is an opportunity for people to get involved in playing music later in life. So that's really important to us. And then of course, the education, the perpetuation of our art form of creating the next generation of professional music, musicians, as well as audiences and, um, and, you know, amateur participants. That's, that's, a really huge responsibility. And so we're really proud of, of having all of those put together uh, in one place in our organization. Um, and, and I think that a lot of orchestras, even if they don't have those within their own organization, they certainly partner um, with those different organizations in order to um, ensure that they can do all the music possible. Okay, and a question about defining success of the Oakland Symphony, as I understand it, publicly traded companies, they kind of define success or failure every quarter, looking at um, you know the bottom line as, uh, or they're trying to look at a, a lot of different things like employee happiness, which probably doesn't matter as much to them. What exactly for the Oakland Symphony, when do you, what are your normal dates to judge if you've been successful or not? And what are the criteria? Well, uh, I think first and foremost for our youth um, and for our, our amateur performers, when they perform and they're able to learn that music and be proud of it and, and you know, have that um, in their lives and to be able to perform it for our community, I think that's a, that's a huge um, success and accomplishment. Um, for our orchestra as a whole, the audience. The audience is, is our primary concern. We wanna ensure that when we look out into the audience, we can look all around and see every representative of our community. Oakland is a really diverse community. There's over 125 language dialects spoken in Oakland alone. So it's a very diverse ethnic community. And we wanna make sure that we can see a little bit of everybody out there. And so that's what we strive to do um, every year, every concert, and every time we see a new face in the audience, we feel successful. And so this goes back to that uh, mission, like uh, you were talking about Michael Morgan, really reaching out to people mm -hmm. and bringing people into the fold. So that uh, is that correct? That's kind of your 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 mission is really to get these people to the concert hall, get them uh, involved in the symphony. Is that right? Absolutely. And, and part of building a great audience, too, is friends and family of chorus members and youth orchestra members. You know, there's, there's a bigger reach. The more people you involve, the more people you include um, and bring into the fold, the more reach that you have in any given community. Fantastic. So we'll get back to that at our round table at the, uh, towards the, uh, a little bit later in the show. For now, let's take a look at the maestro Michael Morgan. Fantastic. So tell us, Mika, when did you meet Michael Morgan and what um, what has his legacy been? Like you said, it's been 30 years that he's kind of defined the orchestra. Uh, most recently, I, when I've been uh, interviewing music managers, or music directors of, of music, music administrators, they have normally said, you know, it's... Uh, actually the administrator who's really in charge of defining what's happening, the music director only comes, you know, five weeks a year or something or eight weeks a year, where the music administrators are every day defining, you know, what's happening, working on employee problems or human resourcing problems, all those kind mm -hmm. of things. So in this case, is it, was it the other way around? Was it the music director really influencing everything or was it a team effort? Tell us about Michael Morgan and his role at the Oakland Symphony. Sure. I met Michael for the first time um, actually about four years ago uh, when I interviewed for the job and we just clicked immediately. 
um, and knew that, that we could work together and do really great things. I would say that it was a partnership in the sense that we, we're responsible for really different things, just like you just said. Uh, but Michael was different than a lot of music directors. He lived in Oakland. Um, some mornings he would wake up and he would get dressed and he'd go down to a school and just visit a school, you know, not because we scheduled it for him and we were bringing press, but just because he wanted to check out what the high school was doing that day. Um, you know, so his investment in the community and the art, he would go to other organizations concerts. He knew what was happening artistically in Oakland. And he was able to pull from that and partner and bring really interesting programs onto our stage because he was always curious. That curiosity developed innovation. Uh, he developed programs that you know artistic administrators and planners are just now starting to think of um, for audiences in completely different ways about how you put together a program to bring different audiences together uh, to have shared experiences, for example. He prioritized some things that, that nobody else was thinking about. So I would say that he was and continues to be one of my major inspirations as I think about accessibility um, and building audiences for this next generation. Um, and so I'm sort of behind the things, uh, the behind the scenes um, person in ensuring that we can get that done. But Michael was, you know, the inspiration. He was absolutely um, the brains and the visionary around this new way of programming and giving access to our communities. Uh, and Martin, might, you want to jump in there? If I could just jump in for a moment and say that I've been in the audience as, uh, of Oakland Symphony many times and also many other orchestras. And I, there is simply no mood at an orchestra concert like there is inside the Paramount Theater of Oakland Symphony. I, I've said to my wife so many times upon leaving an Oakland Symphony concert, how come I have the most, uh, there's so many, there's a lot of great orchestras. How come I always have the most fun here? And it, it's 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 because everything Mieko is saying um, is real. Um, Marty, uh, Martin, can you tell us a little bit about how you met him? Because uh, Mieko said that she met you through pretty much through Michael Morgan. Tell us how did you meet him and what was, uh, uh, what, what was that like? Do you share the same understanding of uh, this, uh, of the late maestro as Mieko? Uh, absolutely. I, I admire Michael Morgan so much. It was so sad, his sudden passing. passing. Um, um, uh, as Mieko mentioned, I was commissioned to write a, a concerto for piccolo and orchestra. And that was launched really by um, a, a great musician, Amy Lykar, who plays flute and piccolo with the orchestra. Um, she approached Michael about the project and he was happy to do it. And I was thrilled. I was just thrilled uh, for the opportunity. And that's when I started you know, interacting with Michael um, and, uh, and the orchestra. And then after, after the concerto, um, a few months later, I, I, then I felt like I, I knew Michael and I returned to him and I said uh, about the oratorio, I said, Michael, there's a great story that's absolutely dying to be told musically. And that's, and that's, how, the, that's how this oratorio came into being. Wow. Okay. So, and d did his uh, so-called uh, social uh, social platform is that what inspired you to go from uh, writing for the Piccolo to writing about the Great Flint sit down uh, strike? The short answer is yes, but honestly, this this story of the Great Flint sit down strike had been in my head for years. I for about four years I fantasized that it would be an opera. Uh, I call that my delusional fantasy. And then um, it was Rebecca Engel, the librettist, who thought it might actually work better as an oratorio. And I mean, opera companies do operas, but symphony orchestras produce oratorios. And, and that's when I, so that's when I felt like it might be a good, so it was in my head for years, and then I felt like it might be a good fit uh, when I understood what Michael is about. And uh, Martin, can you tell us, uh, Professor, shall I say, can you tell us a little bit about this? Uh, like you said, oratorio is for symphony orchestra concerts, opera is for opera houses. Can you tell us about the history? What, what do you mean by that? Well, um, an opera is more like a play that is sung with actors, and makeup and costumes and the scenery sets. Um, that is really not the purview of an orchestra. Um, and the orchestra is down in the pit while the, the singers are on the stage. And they both, both operas and oratorios began about the same time in the early 1600s in Europe, in, in, in Italy, 
um, the most famous oratorio, which is, you know, the, the singers are in front of the opera, the, the, the orchestra and the choir on stage and they're not moving around. That began, um, uh, you know, in Italy, but, but the most famous one would be the Messiah by Handel. That's, that's the most well-known oratorio. That's not an opera. And, and so that's what I've written. I've written an oratorio. They went out of fashion for over, for about 250 years. And then about the last 15 years, they've come, they're starting to come back into fashion again, but usually with more secular themes. Um, there's sort of a, resurg a resurgence of the form of the oratorio form. Okay, so generally, uh, in other words, the oratorio has always been about some kind of historical event, something like that, not some kind, or, or correct me. Well, it, you, it often was, but it was, often, it, was, it was some kind of story. It was often a religious story, like the Messiah or uh, another famous um, uh, one by Handel, Israel in Egypt, you know, a biblical story. Um, it's in more recent years that it became some, something not religious um, uh, most of the time. Okay, and as we'll see, there are, are also duets, there are arias, uh, we'll, and we will take a look at that in one moment. Right now, though, I would like us to take a look uh, to get a better idea of what the Great Flint sit-down strike is all about. Here, let's take a look here. It was a bitter winter in January. Flint was the valley forge of the people who work in the plants. These were times when the summer soldiers fell away and the winter soldiers stood up in a terrible trial. Armchair generals and colonels were demanding that the National Guardsmen go into those plants and shoot the sit-downers out. But for once, the National Guard truly maintained law and order. The strikers were disciplined, but the Flint city government was the General Motors government after all, and General Motors insisted, so the police tried to evict the sit-downers. This is not vandalism you see there. They are breaking these windows to let the air in and to let the tear gas out. to end the sit-down strike in tear gas and blood as if it were a kind of 13th century peasants revolt fail. So uh, Marty, to Martin, tell us a little bit about this. So clearly this is a very uh, biased uh, report telling us the, uh, how the, the strikers are such heroes. I had never heard about this sit-down strike prior to meeting you. Tell us about its significance, what happened and ultimately why you decided to write about this. Sure, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, I'll, I'll say that I grew up about 45 minutes from Flint. My mother had been a union organizer and helped, not, not during the Flint strike afterwards, but she helped grow uh, the United Auto Workers Union. Her mother, my grandmother, uh, a little over a century ago at the age of 15 was one of the leaders of the great garment workers strike in Philadelphia. So I felt like union sympathy is, is in my blood, that's for sure. So this strike, it was um, 1937, the height of the Great Depression. General Motors was the largest corporation in the world, uh, the equivalent of Microsoft or Amazon. Its president was Alfred Sloan. There were thousands of auto workers inside about a dozen plants. They were exhausted. Their nerves were frayed. They froze in the wintertime, you know, winter, winter in Michigan. Um, in the summertime, the temperatures um, sometimes arose inside the plant to 130 degrees. They were breathing toxic fumes. It was always, there was always about 500 people outside the plant waiting for a job. Hundreds would be hired and fired every day. So picture all the tasks it takes to make a car. It's coming down on the assembly line. I'm just gonna choose one, one of so many jobs at random, uh, tax fitters. Cause I always remember, I had not known what a tax fitter is. He puts a bunch of tax in his mouth cause it's easy to grab a tax from your mouth. Not very safe orally, but that's what they would do. And you, you run on his job would be to put uh, the tack, the upholstery uh, on the interior seats um, in the right place. So you're running alongside the car, taking tacks out of your mouth, uh, putting the tacks in, tacks in, and it takes you a certain amount of time to do that. Maybe I'm going to guess maybe about 20 seconds. Then you run back to your starting point and you take it. Your next car is coming down the line. You do it again all day long, all day long. They were sometimes described, they described themselves like puppets on a string 
or sometimes I said it's an eight hour basketball game without a break. Um, um, the slightest error and you were fired. If you said you were sick, a form, the foreman often liked to answer, oh, die and prove it, die and prove it. Um, I could go on and on. Finally, these workers had had it and they said enough. And um, we, uh, Rebecca Engel and I spent 11 days pouring through the historical archives in Michigan and Detroit and Flint and Ann Arbor and some other, some other locations. It, and we felt the thrill I understand now the thrill that historians feel when they're holding the documents of an earlier time, reading the handwriting and the bad spelling of a lot of workers. Anyway, this, the Great Flint sit-down strike was the most important strike in American history. Why? There were lots of other dramatic strikes whose workers did not prevail, um, but the Flint auto workers won. Why did they win? They, they, they used a fairly recent tactic. It was called a sit-down strike. They sat down. They didn't, they didn't pick it in front of the plant. They sat down inside the plants. They halted production by occupying the factories for about, for 44 days. This was known as a sit down strike and the workers came to be known as sit downers. And their victory changed America. In a nutshell, they gave, the, they gave America its middle class. They gave America its middle class. And that is not an exaggeration. After they won a wave of unionism uh, swept the country, working class incomes rose, income inequality diminished to the, uh, its lowest level in United States history. Um, workers could own a modest home. You'll hear this song, by the way, take a vacation. They could send a child to the state college. Um, it, it created what we came to know as a middle class when say a butcher and a secretary could get married and buy a house. Um, um, I'm sorry, was there another part of your question? Yes, there was. Well, I just wanted to ask you, uh, how can you be so certain? I mean, it sounds a, a little bit like almost uh, exaggerated just for, to hear that uh, uh, this one historical event uh, was able to create the, the middle class. Uh, yeah. how, can, how can you be so certain that there had such a, such a large effect when, for, for instance, I hadn't even heard of it? Yes, right. And you know, growing up, in, I'll just say, growing up in Michigan, I think most of the people I knew were, were aware of the strike in the 70s and the 80s. It hadn't been that long. And now it's pretty much receded from the, from the national memory. And it's something that I think should be remembered. Why do I, I'm not exaggerating. Um, it started in Flint and it became a national story. But after the battle we saw on the video, I'm glad you showed it, which is nicknamed the Battle of Bulls Run. Uh, Bulls was a nickname for policemen. Um, um, it became national news. And um, I, you know, there's a picture of, I mean, it became headline news. 14 workers were shot by the national, by, by the police, which were controlled by General Motors. And that became headline news coast to coast. In fact, I, I mean, I have a, a headline from the Oakland Tribune, as well as lots of other cities. Um, 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 front page news, 14 workers were shot. Um, but then it became national news. And then the, the sit-down strike went to 35 other cities. I mean, the, the plants were not only in Flint, they spread throughout the United States. And then after they won that strike, um, um, that's what inspired a wave of unionizing. Now I will add, it was the depression. Franklin Roosevelt had been elected as a friend of the worker. So it was the, it was the new deal. It was the mood of the time. Um, and it was a reaction against the depression. But really this strike was what changed the whole chemistry um, of unionizing. Um, it was very controversial, of course. And the tactic of sit down, sitting down inside a plant was like either they're heroic men fighting for their dignity, which is what I believe, or they were criminal trespassers on, on somebody else's property. And that was, that was a contention among almost every citizen in the United States. Wow, and if I may add, perhaps uh, it may be that the onset of World War II somehow uh, shrouded uh, this uh, uh, strike uh, as uh, old news uh, when such a, mag uh, mag uh, a monumentous uh, uh, war was coming about. And perhaps uh, it's they who actually would end up fighting in that war and coming back to make a, a new society. So true, a great, a great point, yeah. So let's take, uh, let's go now to this special oratorio that you uh, obviously uh, 
really put your whole heart and soul into. Tell us about this first aria we're going to hear now. This is, uh, like you said, talking about just being left with bills. Today, that seems to be a very, very relevant topic, uh, especially among millennial workers and also retirees about around uh, about just a, about anybody who's uh, suffering from the inflation of today. Yeah, and thank you for adding that. I don't consider this a piece of nostalgia for, for the 30s. Um, I, I think it's very relevant today. This, this, we're just going to hear about one minute of an aria, which is a solo piece for, um, you know, this is for a tenor, a wonderful singer named Taylor Staten. And uh, he'll be accompanied on piano by Stacy Pinline. Now, please know uh, this will be performed by a, a singer with the Oakland Symphony behind, behind him when the performance comes. So just for the sake of preview previews, we have a piano rather than the rather than the whole orchestra. This is by my favorite character. Um, this is sung by my favorite character of all these amazing characters. His name is Francis O'Rourke. Um, he kept a diary during each of the 44 days of the strike. He was a, a poignant writer and he was a worrier, but I will say in his entries, he worried about real things. He wasn't, uh, not exaggerated crazy worries, but like, when will the cops come? When will this happen? Well, the food, I mean, there's a lot of details. And he would wake up in the middle of the night and express his concerns. But he, he was, the, to me, the voice of the workers on the floor, in the plant, especially after it becomes national news. Um, the president is involved. The secretary of labor is involved. I mean, but to me, Francis O'Rourke was the voice of the most courageous men in the plant. So he's singing, uh, this is his first diary entry. And he says, well, Mr. Diary, here we are. The strike has been coming. That's what we're going to hear. Okay. Wow, powerful. So uh, Martin, tell us about this, the music that you write to accompany it. Uh, clearly it uh, has certain motives uh, connecting to the words. It's not uh, uh, melodic so much. We wouldn't, uh, I, don't, I don't think I could re-sing you any of, the, of the, the melodies that he was singing. Tell us about this and the piano and the, the orchestra accompaniment. How did you set this to music? Uh. <laughs> it's hard, uh, but 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 um, uh, we didn't hear in this excerpt. It's going to be it's going to begin with a long string melody, which I, I hope people will find beautiful. I hope so. That's what we composers all, always are hoping. Um, but when it comes to singing the words and conveying information melodic, I'll say melodically, but there's not a recurring tune. Um, I agree with you. There's not a recurring tune. Um, what I do when I'm doing this, when I'm working on this, I take the words, I sing it myself so many ways. I, do I want to go up on this word? Do I want to go higher on this word? Maybe that word is short. Maybe that word is long. Um, you, you, you have to convey the text and hopefully do it in a, in a pleasing way. Um, but I, by the time uh, any chunk of music is done, I have sung it to myself. So I'm no singer, but I, I'm a musician. I've sung it so many times. And there's many ways many ways to set words. And I don't know of any perfect formula for it. I just keep trying this, I try that. And uh, coming from the instrumental music that you've uh, written, obviously uh, 
if we listen to your piccolo concerto, we won't uh, think it's, will we think it's the same composer or will we think, oh, this is the same composer writing completely different music? The latter, I think, I think it would sound like the same composer. Um, um, there, there's something in an oratory or opera that tends to make the writing a little bit more conservative as you're conveying the text clearly. But, and so the piccolo concerto might be a little bit less so, but there's a lot of melody in that. It would sound like the same composer. Okay, let's listen to the next one. And this is a, a, a duet. Tell us a little bit about this, what we're gonna hear. Sure, this is the end of a movement called Battle Royal. And this is, the movement is about when the, the strike leaves Flint. It's not a local issue anymore and it's gone national. The people are writing to the governor and to the president, the governor of Michigan and the president expressing their opinions, very much like America today, very strong opinions um, on either side. And so finally, these are two characters that are, to me are so interesting. One is Alfred Sloan, the president of General Motors, who I'll just say to me, he likes, he likes human beings to behave like a well-run factory or like a well-made car. He, he, I've studied him a lot. I've read a lot of his words. I don't see him as a man that comprehends the ambiguity and of, of what it is to be a human being and, and with, his, with, his, with our flaws and complications and contradictions and our beauty. Um, he is singing with a mezzo-soprano named Frances Perkins, a fascinating woman and a real warrior. She um, was the Secretary of Labor under President Franklin Roosevelt. Um, she was the first woman secretary of uh, cabinet secretary in history. And FDR mostly kept his hands off. He wanted Francis Perkins to do the, do the work. He certainly kept in touch with the issue, but he kept out of the, the, the news on this and let Francis Perkins be the one. So she tries, she's trying to get Alfred Perkins, uh, I'm sorry, Alfred Sloan to, to negotiate with the strikers. And he says, no. No way, not until they leave my plants. They're trespassers and they're criminals and there's nothing more to say. So they have a meeting and um, he comes to Washington and it went, she feels he shows some flexibility and she's somewhat encouraged. Meanwhile, Alfred, Alfred Sloan, after that meeting, feels like he softened up too much and he calls her at home, something she hated. He calls her at home. There's no call waiting back in 1937. He just picked it up and said, hello. And he has changed his mind, whatever flexibility he showed, he's, he's walking it back in this phone call. And it's a real conversation that really happened. Years later, Frances Perkins reconstructed it to the best of her ability. Let's hear it. Oh, I'm sorry, let me just add, the singers are wonderful. Sharon Campbell is Frances Perkins and uh, Derek Fox is uh, Alfred Sloan. And again, we have Stacey Hainline on the piano. I have never in my life discussed serious business matters with a woman, Madame Perkins. I've decided I won't meet with any representatives of labor in Michigan or anywhere. My attorneys have already begun legal action to have the strikers removed. have no rights. Whatever it takes, I will see them removed. I really don't, really don't like Alfred Sloan. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, Mr. Sloan. I will not pardon what strikers illegally possess our blood. The problem is, Mr. Sloan, you've never once used your mind to wrestle with a moral problem or any problem except making more money. You can't torture me like that. You don't deserve to be counted among decent men. You can't torture me like that. I'm worth 70 million. And I made it all myself. Have you heard about the rich man trying to get into heaven? Seven 
Wow. Well, it does sound like today. <laughs> Not a lot of people listening to each other. So uh, tell, tell us more about that, about writing the music to that. I guess it, it seems like uh, it, it came fairly, fairly quickly to you to uh, write that down on paper. That it also... nothing, nothing has ever come quickly or easily to me. You just want to write it so that the listeners can't tell. So thank you for thinking it did. Nothing does. So um, I had this, this style of music is called a recitative. That's an opera term. They're not really singing a tune. They're singing dialogue. They're not speaking it, but they're singing dialogue recitative. And um, I had never composed a recitative before. And, and I was kind of nervous about it, but, but you know, I didn't have to do much to it when I zoomed into a rehearsal with them. And, um, and, uh, uh, and you know, I, I, felt, I felt pretty good about it. Uh, but um, again, I was singing every phrase, every phrase you heard Martin Rokic sang in his studio, you know, many times. Okay, so this uh, final excerpt we're going to see, it's an aria. Uh, tell us a little bit about Still We Stand. Okay, and I will say this is my favorite movement of the, of the oratorio. Um, it is, um, and of course, we're not hearing the orchestra. Again, I'll remind the audience, there's an orchestra and there's a choir, and we're not, we're not able to show that in any kind of preview format. But this is called Still We Stand. Um, there is another very strong woman in addition to Frances Perkins. She's really like the main narrator and sometimes in the action, sometimes narrating outside the action. She was a real life warrior named Janora Johnson. She was married to one of the sit down strikers, but she, but Janora herself had a great deal to do with the outcome um, and, um, and, the, and, the, and the amazing climax of why the strikers won. I, I won't go into that now, but afterwards, there's an interview with Janora. She had moved to Los Angeles later in life. And she's looking back on the strike and what happened. And she's saying, you know, it was great when we finally won, when the sit downers won. And then in the months and years that followed, she'll talk about this wave of unionizing that I talked about. And then how, yet after about 50 years after the strike, we still, we are still struggling, still have to stand up. Um, I love what she has to say. And I love this character, Janora Johnson. She's sung by a wonderful metal soprano, Jessica Bowers. And the pianist, also wonderful, my dear friend and a, and a co-contributor to Vienna Live, Lena Rivera. And they, they, uh, Jessica flew out from New York and she, she worked with Lena and they recorded it um, just about a month ago. Okay, let's take a look. Yes. 
dancing, dancing and singing all night long. In the months and years that followed, waves of unionizing swept America. Victory in Flint open doors. For the first time, workers could earn enough, enough to keep a family warm and fed and laughing, enough for a home, a holiday, a kid in college, enough to live with dignity, dignity. Wow. Okay. So um, because we're running out of time, I'd like us to start right away with our round table. What is the cultural, quote unquote, cultural role of a symphony orchestra association today? And might political activity be outside its mandate? How about we start with Professor Lino Rivera? Yes, so Simeon, uh, what is the specific question that you want me to answer? So tell us about a symphony orchestra association. What, what is it supposed to do today? What is, it, uh, what is its role in society? Is it supposed to be uh, pursuing a political mandate? Or is, it, um, or is it supposed to be neutral? Is it supposed to do what Mieko was talking about, getting all the people uh, together to come uh, to get in its doors and be part of a of, a, of the association to take part in the association's life, or is it to uh, be a, a making pro, a pro, promoting awareness of political ideas, ideals? Um, I think, generally speaking, uh, my my opinion is that art distills. Uh, what we are experiencing. So whatever it is, whether it's political, religious, social, economic, or anything else in our life, I think the role of art, uh, it could be any art, it could be painting, sculpture, play, dance, and of course music, 
it has to reflect something. It has to be still the things that we cannot express in terms of words. And um, so it doesn't matter what it is, it must reflect our own perception and our experiences in life. That's the role of art itself. Okay, uh, Mieko, would you like to follow up on Lino's uh, quite noble I I uh, idealism? Sure, Lino, thank you. That was actually really beautiful. Um, one of the best put ways to describe art that I've I've heard that or distill um, is so powerful. And you know, I, I completely agree with you in that. And and for us, again, as an orchestra that serves a specific community, and this is the charge I think for every orchestra association around the world, wherever they are, that is their community. And so whatever we work to distill, we want to ensure that it's relevant to our community and helps create conversations, helps people relate to one another right here live and in person. And I think that's truly one of the gifts of live uh, concert experiences. So, uh, you know, I agree, whatever it is, we want to ensure that we are getting our audiences to think, to think about experiences that are not their own, um, you know, and, and to be able to go on this journey, um, stand in someone else's shoes through this experience, for example. Fantastic, Martin. Well, I wanna say, I'd like to say that um, art is bigger than any theory of art. So if we say art should be political, yes, it should. I mean, whatever you want to say it should be, it can be, but it can always be more. Should it not be this? Should it, should it be that instead? So political art, I think, is, is fine. I think that's just one room in a large mansion of the art world. Um, I, I believe an instrumental symphony can be deeply meaningful. I will never say a Beethoven symphony is meaningless because there's no words, but I, I think political art, when done well, it can also be very meaningful. Um, um, I don't think art is political art is very good at crafting policy. If you want to really come down with a healthcare plan that's better than what we have, I don't <laughs> think artists are the ones to do it through music or dance or theater, but to create sympathy or feeling the emotional, the emotional reality, the emotional truth um, underneath, underneath politics. I think that's what we do better than the politicians themselves. Fantastic. So I'd like to invite uh, all of our participants to take part in this discussion. Uh, if you would like to comment or ask a question, uh, please feel free. Just turn on your microphone and start talking or write something in the chat room. Uh, Martin, Mieko, and Lino are here to hear your comments, to answer your questions. So please feel free to take part. So I'd like to um, turn the conversation a little bit um, a little bit uh, on its head, talking about the other side of the political spectrum. Uh, clearly, the, uh, for instance, the um, so-called white nationalists or the more conservative uh, political um, representatives in the United States at this time, they would probably, I imagine, see what uh, Michael Morgan has done and what uh, uh, clearly uh, the, the trajectory that you are, are all talking about um, this inclusiveness, about including different identities, they would say, well, you know, you're not including us. You know, you're not including, you know, uh, white people. And uh, also I personally have had that uh, experience then before uh, applying for a job at a place that was supposed to be representing uh, uh, different kinds of people who do not, you know, fit in traditional uh, white male categories. And they told me, well, you're a white male. Why would you apply for this job? And well, so, I, I mean, what, um, what, what is your response to that? Is there any way to hear, like we heard Mr. Sloan uh, saying, well, I made all these, this money myself. I mean, it's something that would probably be heard on the Fox News channel. Um, and not to say that it's wrong or that it's uh, right, but to say that that is certainly an idea coming from those uh, that section of the political spectrum at this time to say that, you know, I, I did all the work. I was part of that Flint sit down strike. You know, I took the lashings and I made it happen. So where does this, how can those people be included in this conversation as a part of the Oakland Symphony would be my question, Martin. Well, let me just say one thing. There was a grand total of one African-American sit down striker uh, in Flint and the rest were white working class men. And they weren't, um, none of them were Stanford scholars. And um, 
And so this is really a story about, about those people as much, certainly as much as, as anyone else. And, um, um, but besides that, you've, you've got a bigger point than about just the oratorio. I think the challenge for, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm liberal, I'm definitely liberal. I think the challenge for our, for our side is to, um, when we say inclusivity, we have to mean, what does it really mean? And it really means the big picture and it means everybody. And quite honestly, it's one of the reasons I admire Michael Morgan so much. He meant everybody. And, um, but it is a challenge um, because it, sometimes it's, it's, in some quarters, there's a de facto feeling like not quite everybody, not white, not white men. And, and I think that that is our challenge. Um, that is our challenge. Everybody wants to be included. And when they feel excluded, they feel resentful. And, and who can blame them? Who can blame them? None of us want to feel that way. Lino? Yes, I agree with, uh, with Marty uh, regarding that. You know, I, I have nothing else to add to, to that one. I agree. <laughs> Mieko? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree as well. And I, I think the way to think about this is we can't leave anyone behind. Um, this is about a society. This is about all of us being able to have wonderful middle class lives that are starting to actually disappear. And it's because we have this infighting. We need to come together on values that are beyond our ethnic identities, but rather just what are the lives that we want? There is no zero sum. Everyone has an opportunity to thrive. Just because your neighbor thrives doesn't mean you can't thrive. And I think that's the message that we all need to come together and experience. And I think art can actually show us. We experience things very similarly. And it's not about canceling Beethoven or anything like that. It's Beethoven and. How do we make Beethoven a living piece of our current society by also bringing in new works? Um, you know, how do we how do we communicate with each other better and more empathetically? And I think that's really where art comes into play here. And again, it's not about you know, oh, you don't agree with me, we're not going to talk anymore. You can't be a part of this, and you know, our orchestra is only for these people here. No, you are welcome. We need to have these conversations and find a way to be to talk with each other. Otherwise, there will continue to be the, the you know, Alfred Sloan's that are worth 70 million and in today's numbers, you're talking, you know, $7 trillion or whatever. Um, while everyone else is just starving on the ground, that is more money than, than that person even needs. Um, and it, it is off of others' backs. And so it's not that we don't wanna celebrate their successes, but there's room for everyone to thrive in our world, in our country, and in our communities. And we just need to hold hands and be empathetic and care about one another to do that. No one has to lose anything. And to follow up on that, Mieko, how, tell us what's the, uh, your strategy. Clearly, you're, uh, um, you're the executive here on this show. Tell us what is, you know, is there any concrete um, strategies or tactics that you would recommend to other executives to, to reach out to these people, to, um, to uh, speak to people who say, oh, I hate the opera, or I, I don't like this, or, or, or to reach out to those, like we said, those uh, alpha, alpha males? Well, I don't know that you can convince anybody necessarily, but it's about creating the opportunity. It's about being welcoming. It's about creating that space where people can come together, where we can have a concert that has something like Marty's piece, you know, alongside something that is, you know, a war horse, the stalwart part of our repertoire, for example. So we can bring two different audiences together to sit in the same room. Let's just start there. You know, we don't have to solve, um, you know, world peace or hunger or any of those things. Let's just try to sit together in the same room for a moment and see what happens from that. And the more we can do that, I think the more success we will find together. It's fantastic. To, follow, to finish up today then, uh, our great conversation, I would like to ask Mieko, uh, if, you, uh, if Michael uh, Morgan were here today, the late maestro, um, what would you say to him? Oh, I miss you so terribly. This work is hard um, without him. You know, it continues to be fun, but he is truly, truly missed, um, but we're continuing that work. His legacy is secure um, and we're spreading it. Martin? 
I would say thank you, Michael. Thank you for what you achieved. You created a, an orchestra series that is the most fun place I go. And the music making is, is great too. And, and it's, the audience, it's the audience I like to be around, diverse, lots of different kinds of people. Um, and I thank you for that. It was not easy. And I also would like to thank Michael Morgan for changing my life. Um, things changed for me when he decided, to, when he programmed my piccolo concerto and then, and then this oratorio. And it was transformative for me. I'm, I am, I'm grateful to him. Um, I'll stop there. Okay. The silence says it all. Let's, uh, let's see how we can stay in touch with the Oakland Symphony. There it is, www.oaklandsymphony.org. Uh, so Mieko, we can reach out to you by clicking on contact. We can uh, call you up or, or write to you somehow through absolutely, this. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, those inquiries, if you, um, you know, address it to me, will come right to me. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So feel free to reach out to Mieko. She's uh, there to uh, keep this conversation going. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find her on the Oakland Symphony website. There it is again, oaklandsymphony.org. And let's take a look at... Um, Martin's website, if I can get this to cooperate with me. There it is. It is martinrokic.com. And Martin, people can reach out to you there by uh, mm -hmm. clicking on connect and then going over to and filling out this form. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Fantastic. Okay, so there it is again, my, uh, martinrokic.com. I'll put that in the chat room. Feel free to reach out to him ask him uh, questions, uh, but uh, be prepared for some uh, very meaningful answers. <laughs> and, okay. And may I just add, I see somebody has, has asked a question in the chat room. When will this be premiered? And I don't know if we said, it will be November, Friday, November 4th, uh, however many months away that is. Excellent. Be okay. Fantastic. So um, thank you so very much to Martin Rokic. Thank you very much to Mieko Hatano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the great musicians who performed. Thank you again, Simeon. So let's take a look at next week. What's coming up? We have Peter DeRoy, an audience-centric cultural institution. Dr. Peter DeRoy is a scientist of quote unquote leisure studies. Yes, it is possible. At the Breda University of Applied Sciences, Peter researches what people do for recreation and how governments and NGOs can support citizens in their pursuit of leisure. His research focus is twofold, the management and marketing of cultural organizations and the study of their target audiences. After his workday is done, he applies the knowledge he produces as a member of the supervisory board of a Dutch theater. Quote, how can cultural institutions be more audience centric? is the question at the heart of his work. In the West, the Netherlands is considered a pioneer of daring cultural innovations, but contrary to popular belief, Peter's research has found some ironic outcomes to organize efforts to, for example, get a younger generation to patronize theaters. By signaling new, more casual dress codes and inviting audience members to quote unquote, crack a beer during shows, a renowned Dutch theater was not able to attract a younger audience. Come welcome Peter to our show for an exclusive look at audience-centric theaters and cultural organizations. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmorrow.com. Once again, that is next Wednesday, Peter DeRoy, an audience-centric cultural institution. Once again, thank you to Martin Rokic. Thank you to Mieko Hatano and Lino Rivera. Thank you very much to Agnieszka Rivole for her support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile from New London, New Hampshire, and Oakland, California. Goodbye and see you next week.